Well, good evening, everyone, and you're very welcome. As um, we'll just give you a minute or two for everyone to join us. And thank you very much for joining us on the third night of International Dark Sky Week, Mayo style, our virtual roadshow of Mayo's Dark Skies. So for those of you that have joined us before, um, you may already be familiar with the drill. So we have, um, we'd like to know where you're from. And we have um, a little um, word cloud set up called menti.com. So you can probably see in the blue writing there, menti.com. If you have a smartphone or a, um, a second screen, you can open, uh, go to the browser menti.com and type in the code uh, 43, it's just hidden from my view, 43055871. Or for those of you that like a bit of technology, there is a QR code that you can scan in uh, to your phone. And while people are joining, we'll, um, we'll be able to see where you're all from, which is great. Um, so as I say, welcome to International Dark Sky Week. Um, we have a fantastic night lined up ahead. Um, just to uh, point out a couple of bits of housekeeping, um, we'll have a chat box um, for comments and for welcome messages and hellos. Um, we also have a questions and answer uh, box, which is uh, for you to put your questions in. And if you can keep to that, that will be helpful for us to, uh, to monitor it later on. Uh, the questions and answers also has an upvoting system. So if you see a question that you would like asked uh, <coughs> to save you retyping it yourself, you can just give it a thumbs up and that will put it to the priority list. So we'll ask the highest voted questions first. So, um, so my name is Georgia Macmillan. I'm going to introduce you in a moment to our, um, our host for, um, for the evening for, from Ackle Island. So I want to say how uh, thankful we are to be visiting virtually Ackle Island and to thank them for hosting us. Um, I'm especially delighted to be joining Ackle, another island in the dark sky community um, this week. And I was looking out the window today thinking what better place uh, would I like to be right now than walking on a mountain in Ackle Island. So uh, we really look forward to doing that very soon. Um, and Dark Skies is, is very close to the heart of a lot of people there and none more so than um, the lady that's going to host us uh, for the evening. Uh, her name's Sarah Lavelle and Sarah's going to tell us a little bit now about um, Ackle Island and the Dark Sky campaign there and then she will be hosting the evening and introducing us to our good friend um, Frank Prendergast, uh, our main speaker. So with that, I'll hand over and thank you, Sarah, for having us. Um, myself and Carol Loftus will be monitoring the, uh, the chat box um, for the evening. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Georgia. Um, good evening, everyone from Michael Island. Uh, we are delighted to host our first event as part of the Mayo Dark Skies Park community. For those of you who are not familiar with Acca, we are Ireland's largest island, tied to the mainland by the Michael David Bridge. <coughs> Acca is synonymous for its pristine coastline with five blue flag beaches, two of which have recently been listed in Ireland's top 10 best beaches by the Lonely Planet. So just over a year ago, the newly formed community group Nyarth Akla discussed the possibilities of having the night skies in Akla recognised by the International Dark Skies Programme. It seemed a natural progression to protect this wonderful natural immunity we have and to educate and generate interest among the local children in the stars above us. We also felt it could be another opportunity to market Akla to the tourists during the darker winter months. So we sent a few emails off um, to Diana and Adam in the International Dark Skies Places programme. And I'm realising very naively that it was a much more complicated process than we had initially thought. We enlisted help from the Friends of Mayo Dark Skies. So Georgia could have not been more enthusiastic and supportive and a few long winded emails turned into a longer phone call as she shared her knowledge and offered advice. 
We were delighted to learn that our neighbours in Inish Turk and Clare Island were also becoming part of the Mayo Dark Sky Park community. So um, about a year working on this project and around eight months sitting in on meetings with friends of Mayo Dark Skies, I've come to realise just how important that protecting our night sky is from an ecological perspective. Um, we all have a duty to protect and preserve it. Thinking about the night sky too, we know we're, it is obvious that it's played a central role in the lives of our ancestors in navigating journeys between the island communities of Mayo. And now it's a nice <coughs> way we can connect the islands of Ackle to Inish Turk, Ackle, Inish Turk and Clare again. What we've done so far, um, students of the uh, coastal guiding course run by FITOS and the ETB in Ackle have taken initial light, measure, light readings. And that's shown for the most part, the skies above us are of a really good quality. However, there are some poor areas. These measurements are important because they shed light on those areas and we can address this problem head on with remedial action, <laughs> ensuring that good lighting practices are in place and establish future protection, protection and policies. So it is really, we're really grateful to have the help of Friends of Mayo, Jack Skies with us. Um, looking back on those first few emails with Georgia, she sent me a wonderful poem by an Apple poet, Sheila McHugh. Um, Sheila wrote this for Mayo Dark Skies Week and the poem is called Night Skies Constellations. So I put together a slideshow of astro photographs of Akka and put Sheila's poem or recitation of the poem with it. And I'm going to share that with you now. Bear with me. Um, here we go. Did you see the stars last night? Oops. Like flakes of ackle sea salt sprinkled across a pristine parchment sky. Pergamum never saw the likes of it. A virtual library of mythical proportions. Here, the chained maiden Andromeda, the ruler of man. There, our own Columba, the dove. And look, Venus in March, bright, regal and beautiful. But that's not all. The rocks on Slevemore Mountain stir. Portals open to the celestial call, unveiling the heavenly constellation mapped in astronomical precision on our island home. From the starting, follow Ariandis thread through souterrain passages to Giant's Grave, Crumloch and Cashel. A labyrinthine journey into mysterious darkness. That's um, Sheila's lovely poem. So perhaps reflecting on those last verses, she draws um, connections to the stars above us and the rich archaeology of Akal, specifically the mountain Steve Moore. And it's very fitting that the Akal community host Dr. Frank Prendergast, renowned as archaeoastronomer and emeritus research fellow to DIT, at DIT to discuss mountains, mysteries and megaliths. So that's all from Akal at the moment. Over to you, Frank. Thank you. I'm just going to... Okay, just a quick tech check that you have my first slide up, Georgia. Looks good, Frank. Thank you. Okay, and my volume is okay? It's for me. That's great. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, what a pleasure and an honour it is for me to be part of this great festival. I've been with several of your previous ventures in the past and they go from strength to strength. And to be asked again, 
means that, uh, you know, I have an opportunity to perhaps diversify a little bit and talk more widely about the work I do and how that might fit into your great mission of dark sky promotion and protection. I'm based here on the East Coast in Skerries, north of Dublin, right on the coast, and I have a direct view to islands outside my house. So in a sense, I feel very connected tonight with Ackle. When asked to talk about Ackle, um, I tore up the previous script, as you know, Georgia, and I started again, because as I looked more at Ackle, I realized there was so much in Ackle, which could act as a kind of template for the whole country in effect, in terms of what I want to talk to you about tonight. And what I'll talk to you tonight about is what I am in terms of the disciplines that I work in and the research I carry out. And it's a heady mix of landscape archeology, span geology, archeology, span astronomy, culture, and I could go on, even statistics and maths. I'll spare you the statistics and maths tonight, not a formula or an equation to be seen anywhere in my 30 slides, which are going to follow. So to begin, just to, uh, my first slide is a look at the Irish landscape in a geological perspective. The left slide shows you the most recent research that's been carried out on the island of Ireland and Britain in terms of the last ice age. Now, I know we've come through weeks of cold weather, but bear in mind that the last ice age, which at its peak about 27,000 years ago, spread over Ireland and most of Britain to the extent that's shown in the white area over the two islands. And what's interesting here is that unlike previous geological publications, the map of the ice sheet has been completely revised. Now we know that the whole of the island was completely covered by ice to a depth of around 900 meters thick. And you might often hear fanciful figures of, you know, many kilometers thick. No, about 900. That's still one hell of a thickness. And when you look at Britain, you realize that in the period up to about, say, 12,000 years ago, it would not have been possible for humans to live or exist in Ireland as it was geologically defined. Whereas in Southern Britain, that was the case. People were in Britain at that time, 12,000 years ago and earlier, uh, but not in Ireland. And certainly by 12,000 years ago, the ice sheet was melting and retreating northwards, allowing people to migrate into Ireland from mainland Britain and Europe. If you look at the right-hand slide, you see a terrific example by a geologist, Matthew Parse, a colleague of mine, which shows the scraping of the barren rock by the ice at that time. So such was the thickness and the weight and the abrasiveness of the ice that you get this scoring of the landscape at the bottom of the ice sheet. What's also interesting is that geologists now know that then Above the 900 meter contour, there were some ice-free peaks known as nunataks, and that is a sort of a Canadian Indian word. Um, and those ice-free peaks were very, very small in extent and widely separated. So they were the only ice-free parts of the landscape at that time. But as the thousands of years rolled forward and the ice sheet retreated, so the climate ameliorated and it became possible for us to have, in a sense, human occupation on the island. When we look at the topography of Ireland, um, this wonderful image created by NASA, and it's a hill shaded hill, uh, relief image of the island of Ireland and its mountains and its landscape. And broadly what you have is a fringe of mountains surrounding a mostly lowland central plain. And I focused on the island of Ackle, for those who are not familiar with where we are, because not everybody's from Ireland viewing this presentation, um, we have Ackle over here on the west coast, a beautiful detached landscape. And on the right, I have mapped um, the topography using terrain modeling to show you by adding the river courses and the water bodies, the topography of the island as it is. And this island is a magical place. It is a habitat of special and international renown, uh, renowned for its sea cliffs. It's a comparatively small island. It's 22 kilometers by 20 kilometers, roughly, has a coastline length of 80 kilometers, so quite small in a, in a sense. But it is considerably mountainous. 
And we have Shlieve Moore, Crohan, Minon, Corran Hill and Paul Rennie. All of these are impressive pieces of landscape when you visit this place. And you have the highest sea cliffs in Europe, in fact, on the north side of that island. So well worth a visit just for that very reason. Now, when we look at places and names and maps, because I'm going to use mapping for a, a few of my slides, just to illustrate the contribution that surveying has made to our understanding of our history. One of the great surveys undertaken in the post-medieval Ireland period was the down survey. That word down is curious. It just simply means plotted down on paper, nothing to do with the county down. So it's plotting down on maps, all to do with the Cromwellian confiscation of land in the period 1656 to 1668. It was an incredible project, masterminded by Dr. William Petty, who was a surgeon to the army in Ireland at that time, but turned himself into an administrator and a surveyor for the purpose of executing the first systematic mapping of the island. And that mapping produced maps of baronies and of parishes, all with the intended purpose of confiscating land. And the green color on the right-hand map of Ireland shows you an area west of the Shannon, broadly Connacht, and to hell or to Connacht is a well-known phrase in Irish history, where the dispossessed Irish were going to be transplanted in a sense. And all of the other color codes show how Ireland was envisaged as being confiscated land apportioned out to the government, to the army, to the adventurers who funded the campaign. And interestingly, in the middle here, I've got the island of Achill. And there is a barony map of Achill in existence, but it's been lost. And if anybody knows where it is, do let me know. Um, but I've taken the barony map out of Petty's Ireland map, and it shows you in the 17th century, the topography of the island and how Schlieve Moor, as it's now called, was known then as Slumore. And my good friend, the historian Aidan Heron tells me, who's listening in by the way, so I better praise him, that, you know, these names would have been given to the people on the ground who were tasked with recording the names, wrote down what they heard phonetically, and hence you get names which are appearing on maps which bear little resemblance, some resemblance to what we have today. But you will agree that the shape of Ackle for the time and the survey techniques is incredibly good. An accuracy of about 15 to 20 percent is attributed to the down survey. Petty also left us by mosaicing the, bar the barony maps, the first realistic map of Ireland, top left. That was an incredible leap forward in terms of mapping and geography of the island at that time. Prior to that, anything Irish in terms of mapping was fanciful. This is the first realistic map of Ireland. If we look at the next map and the most important map of Ireland, which would have been produced by the Ordnance Survey, then known as the Trigonometrical Survey between 1833 and 1846, a mapping campaign started on the island to record the topography and the place names and the features and as much as possible as would fit for the scale of the map. And here you have an example of the first large scale map of Achill. And there you see Schlieve Moor. And the reason I'm mentioning Schlieve Moor is I'm going to be giving Schlieve Moor particular attention tonight. And we'll come back to that later in the talk. But this is the map from around the 1830s. And it shows accurately to an incredible degree of accuracy for its time, all of the place names that we're now familiar with and the water courses and the topography and the towns and the places. And these, of course, are representative of the many maps which cover the island at that time from that survey. That survey is worth mentioning, just in a little more detail for a moment, in the context of Ackle. And of course, what I say for Ackle has applicability across the whole island, uh, but I'm using Ackle as the perfect template to illustrate a few points. On Ackle, on the summit of Schlieve Moor, you have a triangulation pillar. That is the only island in the whole survey of Ireland in the 1830s, which has a trig pillar. Ackle is special in a sense for that reason. 
So what I tell you now is that on the summit of Akel, you have a piece of scientific infrastructure which should be cherished and protected and never torn down. It is a legacy to scientific achievement and endeavor, which was unsurpassed in the 1800s. In the 1800s, Ireland led the world in terms of its cartographic mapping and its achievements. Three people I've picked out from the long list of many names. Thomas Colby, who directed the whole survey. He was an engineer surveyor, came over from Britain and tasked with doing the complete mapping of Ireland at the unprecedented scale of six inches to one mile. Thomas Drummond worked for the survey and Drummond is famous for one thing, in particular, the invention of what is known as the limelight. When he found that you burn phosphorus at night, it burns brilliantly. And if you look at the right-hand map, on the summit of Ackett Island, Schlieve Moor, the red triangle indicates the triangulation pillar that was used as part of the measuring process to create a framework so as to connect all of the measurements accurately and create these maps. So you see Schlieve Moore's place in the national triangulation figure, which is shown in the diagram here, the primary network. And what's interesting, Georgia, is that Schlieve Moore is directly connected by a line of sight to Neffen. So I think you're going to love that. And also to other peaks in the distance, Tona Moore and Ben Cor. Bear in mind the distances. These are very long lines of sight. And in order to measure the angles using this great theodolite, which was created for the purpose of the survey, manufactured by Ramsden, the great um, optical maker, um, these observations would have been undertaken at night. And at night was the best time to carry out these observations because the atmosphere was clearer and better, provided you illuminated the distant targets. So bringing this talk to uh, relevancy in terms of dark sky now, in a landscape in the 1830s, you would have had near total darkness, other than small villages illuminated perhaps by small lamps and lights. So in a sense, in the 1800s, for the purpose of the surveyor's work, a very dark landscape at night. So they lit fires on the summits of these trig point hills and then observed with the theodolite at night. And these were tough conditions and very tough times and surveyors died of exposure doing this work. Such was the importance of the work, they died for the cause. And those are measurements which stand to this day as testimony to an incredibly accurate survey. If I talk about dark sky in the 1820s, would you believe that gas was first pumped and appeared in Dublin in 1825 at the same time as the survey was undertaken. And gas continued to be used to light the streets up until 1957 when electric light took over. And in 1866, still during the time of the survey, three major gas companies were formed called the Alliance and Consumers Gas Company to light the city as far as Kilmain and Fairview and Roth Mines. So outside of the main conurbations of the big cities, I'm not sure about the other cities like Limerick, Cork and Galway, but certainly in Dublin, lighting was beginning to appear and street lighting was beginning to appear. And that was an interesting one. And what I should have said was, and if I can just backtrack to the previous slide, in the time of the down survey in the 1600s, candlelight was used for lighting of streets. And I came across a reference to private street lighting began to appear in 1616 in Dublin. And there was a candlelight law passed, which dictated that every fifth house had to display a light for the guidance of street users. Now that was certainly in Dublin. And this was in 1616 preceding the down survey. And by 1697, public lighting was for the first time undertaken in certain sections of the, of the city by contract. So lighting and dark skies, no threat there because the power of the lighting at that time would have been fairly minimal and of low power, I guess. So that's the trig survey and a, a look at lighting at that time. The trigonometrical survey, the ordnance survey, gave us another great scientific baseline. 
the formation of a national grid system, which came later, not then. And I've been able to exploit the national grid system on which all our maps are now based to look at our megalithic tradition across the island very quickly. So what you have is a blank sheet of paper here and imagine that this sheet encompasses the whole width of the island and the breadth of the island, the length of the island. And I'm going to drop onto that a whole series of dots which represent the, the megalithic past in terms of prehistoric tombs and other structures. So down the bottom, I've added dots for the core tombs and I'll define those in a moment. And these date to nearly 3000 and 4000 BC. And there is 400 core tombs distributed across the top of the island mostly. If I add the portal tombs, which are of about the same time, the Neolithic past, very ancient. We have nearly 200 of those, and I'm just building dots. The passage tombs, of which there are 230, again, distributed mostly towards the top end of the island. The wedge tombs have their own different special uh, distribution pattern, and they're spread across the island with a big emphasis in the southwest and in the west. And if I show you the stone rows, and again, these are Bronze Age later, I've added 250, and I've added nearly 400 stone circles, which are also Bronze Age. So you're looking at a period in prehistory dating from about 4,000 BC to about 2,000 BC. So extremely ancient constructs. And if we go forward into the early medieval, I'm going to now add the, um, one last monument type, the ring fort. And there are nearly 50,000 of those, more than 50,000 in fact. And without drawing a single line of a map, I've used these dots to construct the map of Ireland in a cultural sense. So you're looking at our civilization, our culture in a series of dots, which are, you know, 50, 60,000 on that one sheet of paper. And I'm going to turn to one of my heroes in science, Carl Sagan, an American astronomer who sadly died prematurely in 1996. He was one of the great science communicators and certainly had a formulative influence on me in my interest in science growing up and in my student years. He looked at the world as a blue dot. I'm looking at Ireland as a series of dots and I'm going to borrow a little quote from Carl Sagan, who wrote fantastic material. And I'm going to borrow what he said about the earth and apply it to what is on your screen there in terms of Ireland, its landscape made of dots. And it is so apt. So Carl, wrote, Carl Sagan wrote, he said, look again at that dot. So you pick out any dot. And if we go over here to the west coast of Ireland, Ackles over here, obviously, Take any one of those dots and Carl Tegan would have said, look again at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everybody you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being, whoever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of religions, ideologies, ideologies and doctrines and every hunter. and forager live there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. What a beautiful piece of writing. So I look at that map and that's exactly what I see. And if we zone in on Ackle and its prehistoric past, and I'll be developing this talk towards dark sky at the very end. Schlieve Moor to the north of the island, the highest peak on the island, 671 meters above sea level. And I've constructed this map using GIS on the national grid and imported the archeological sites from the National Monuments Service database, which if you don't know it, is a fantastic resource and you should visit that because for the whole of the island, you have every monument recorded, listed, positioned and described, an amazing resource. And on that map on the left, you see a red dot to represent one portal tomb, which is early Neolithic, about 3700 BC. 
there are two, three larger yellow dots, which are the court tombs of about the same time. And then surrounding it, you have other smaller yellow dots and to the west, which are unclassified, ruined um, cairns, which can't be interpreted for the moment. Also onto that map, I've dropped and brought in the river and water courses and also Keel Lock. And when I look at La Ackle and I look at the topography and the landscape and stand back and take a kind of helicopter view, what I do notice to my eye is the significant bias towards that part of the island by all of the prehistoric structures, as if to say there is gravitationally something pulling the people towards that part of the island in comparison to the eastern side of the island. And what is it? To my eye, it could be the sheer bulk of the mountain itself. It is the attractiveness of water as a resource and water was a ritual resource as well as an essential life resource. And also, of course, land cover and what kind of soil and land cover existed on Ackle in those far off times. Well, this would be an era before the formation of the bogs. So there would have been to an extent, glacial till, soils and tree cover, much of which has disappeared since. But you have evidence here, just judging by the clustering of the monuments. And by the way, the kissed graves are shown in black squares there. And on the right hand side, I've borrowed two images just to illustrate what a portal tomb would look like and what a court tomb would look like. Those are not from Ackle. Paul Nebron is one of the premier uh, portal tombs on the Burren, excavated by Anne Lynch and produced a wealth of information about our prehistory. And it typifies the transition from early hunter gatherers to a settled community who were beginning the tradition of farming and building stone monuments in parallel with settlements. And those settlements were, of course, houses. And I'll talk about those in a moment. And Crevy Keel down in County Sligo, where I did photograph that one, an enormous structure, an impressive tomb, denuded of its covering cairn in both cases. And there you have the entrance in the foreground of the court tomb leading into a chamber, uh, an area of assembly perhaps, and then behind that you have other chambers. And these are just typifying the kind of structure, the kind of stone monuments that were built with enormous effort and labor in those times with very primitive basic engineering skills. And if we talk about the houses briefly, there are very few houses surviving, whereas we have more than 2000 stone monuments and for obvious reasons, they have survived, although we've lost many. Houses, on the other hand, were built of timber, mostly. And those houses leave no trace on surface and are, in a sense, ephemerally under the topsoils of today and discovered by careful archaeological excavation, very often associated with development-led projects such as motorways and highways and industrial developments. And the top left is a very good reconstruction, an imagined reconstruction, but based on solid archaeology of the foundation trenches of the comfortable dwelling houses that these people would have lived in in the Neolithic. And on the right hand side, you have an illustration showing the activity of moving great stones for the purpose of tomb building. Down in the Bronze Age, there was a shift from rectangular to circular houses. And interestingly, if you do a little calculation, and work out for the same floor area, the length of walls in a rectangular house and the perimeter of a circular house, a round house is 17% more efficient in terms of the amount of labor of, of, of material you need to build a house. So if you're building a house, build round, I would say. And then on the right hand side, you have Falukdafia, which are the cooking pits, one of the methods known to have been used, heating stones, put them into a water receptacle, and then put in your food wrapped in leaves or um, straw to cook. And proximity to water was therefore important for settlement purposes as well. On Ackle, there has been some terrific discoveries made by the archeological school. And there are two, 
um, two Bronze Age roundhouses discovered and dated to about 1300 BC. And you see there the topsoil stripped away during the excavations. And on the right by um, Stuart Rathbone and his work, reconstructions based on what they found. And what you see there, in fact, are stone foundations and timber struts to create the roof and elaborate thatching and entrance features there. So that typifies two roundhouses discovered on Ackle. And all of these things go hand in hand with land cover, lithic resources, and the idea that people were farming and breeding animals and surviving in those landscapes at that time. Another slide that typifies Ackle is the discovery of this pebble, which has obviously and visually a human face carved into it. And this is an artifact which was quite exciting to find, very rare, and shows you that people in those times had time to be creative and to produce artifacts which weren't just functional. And of course, we see that in so many other instances across the archaeological landscape. So that's attributed to the archaeological discoveries of the field school on Ackle as well. And another slide which relates to Ackle and the wider area of Mayo is this beast, the white-tailed sea eagle. And it has a checkered history in Ireland, as all raptors do. This bird has now been returned to Ireland using Norwegian stock and has bred and is beginning to growth, uh, grow in numbers in Ireland. Two strongholds, Loch Derg area and Southwest Kerry. But these birds can range for enormous distances and could easily be seen over the county of Mayo uh, and the offshore islands as well. But what's interesting about this is two things. Um, the name Ackle is largely attributed to, many scholars feel, the word for eagle, which is Aquila, and there are other textual and literary sources which suggest that the naming of the island itself may well be tied in with uh, this particular species of bird, which sadly was shot on Clare Island, the very latest. When doing the research for this talk, I came across a paper in the Irish Naturalist Field Journal and got onto Birdwatch Ireland and Nile Hatch. And we now think that this record produces the latest record for a sea eagle in Ireland, native. And that was a very sad occasion. Interestingly, I came across a clipping uh, to do with the shooting of a white-tailed sea eagle up in Clare Island. And there was a court case and a Mr. Grady is named as the defendant. And he explained as by way of an excuse that he thought it was only a large hawk. But the judge rightly said that you were shooting out of season, but in view of the high character of the defendant, he was given the probation act and let off. I think I've heard that story before. So that's the history of the white-tailed sea eagle and Ireland, and particularly, I think, the interesting association or affinity with the name Ackle. Now, coming on to landscape, um, another reference to Ackle is by the great botanist, Robert Lloyd Prager. And I took the liberty of writing down what he wrote. Ackle, windswept and bare, heavily peat covered, with great gaunt brown mountains rising here and there, and a wild coast hammered by the Atlantic waves, on all sides but the east, has a strange charm which everyone feels, but none can fully explain. Beautiful piece of writing. And interestingly, Prager was somebody that I followed. In a sense, he undertook an island-wide journey to gather botanical and geological facts on the island and to write them up in his famous book, The Way That I Went. The Way That I Went, um, and this involved me for um, quite a number of few years in my doctoral studies at UCD in the School of Archaeology in pursuit of my investigation of the passage tombs of Ireland, not only Ireland, but in Anglesey and in the Channel Islands. So the fieldwork was considerable, but I did finish. And 
I, in a sense, undertook a great journey, just like Robert Lloyd Prager. But my journeys were to visit the passage tombs. Now, passage tombs are middle Neolithic, later than the court and portals. And so many of them are situated on high ground, on elevated places, not all, but so many. And there are many which are in prodigious and precipitous places, which were breathtaking and challenging to get to, not only to climb, but also then to take survey and measurements and do my work. But when we look at a book, uh, the cover of this book, I have a chapter recently published this year called The Archaeology of Height. It's chapter one in this international publication. And this book looks at mountains and their meaning and uses the word phenomenology to, in a sense, draw out from each of the contributing authors the meaning of mountains and landscape and height. And what is phenomenology? It's the study and the theory of what can be observed or felt. You can't do this from a desktop or a computer. You've got to get out there and you've got to be in the landscape. You've got to smell the air, feel the wind and the terror of being on high places and the isolation that goes with it. And mountains are iconic landforms. They physically mediate and connect us. And there are two worlds, the land and the sky. And you should see the horizon in these places as a bridge between two realms, places of myth, places of ritual. So mountains are tangible and they offer the experience of the intangible and feelings of fear, awe, and also power when you're on their summits. You've all, I'm sure, felt that. And when we think about mountains in that phenomenological way, then we're moving now into prehistory and ancient cosmology and how people in the prehistoric past might have regarded their world. And we call this worldview. And ancient cosmology, as distinct from modern cosmology, which is science-based, is all about getting inside the minds of prehistoric people and trying, based as best we can, to imagine how people lived and regarded their world. And we know from ethnographic studies of indigenous people who are living, studied by anthropologists, that worldviews can be regarded as the lived in landscape surrounded by your horizon, an upper world and a lower world. And I'll come to those when we talk about dark sky in a few minutes. And with the upper world, you have the overhead mysterious heavens, which to a Neolithic or prehistoric person would have been unexplainable. We know our place in the universe. We know where we are. We know what's up there. What do they see? An imagined dome studded with stars, studded with moving entities, which appeared and changed their positions nightly, and daily, and seasonally, disappeared into the horizon and rose out of the horizon and descended down into the lower world, the underworld. That was their place. That was their understanding and their existence. That is ancient cosmology and that is worldview. And that is what I study and others in attempt to, in a sense, get inside the Neolithic mind. And there is no other better place then in my island-wide journeys, I found myself in Kerry to visit the renowned Paps of Anu, two amazing hills, which in terms of their obvious femininity exude mythology and amazement. And no matter from which angle you view them, they are stupendous and amazing. It is a landscape steeped in lore, steeped in tradition. The local archeologist, Frank Coyne, has written prodigiously about this special place. On its summit, you have two cairns, which very closely uh, resemble passage graves. There is curbing, there is evidence or suggestion of Neolithic uh, passage tomb building here. Uh, there is some doubt and without a very full excavation, they cannot be typified completely accurately. To my mind, their location and their positioning befits the hallmarks of most of the passage tombs that you find on high ground. And when you speak of high ground, I'm positioned here in the lowland, looking at the summits high up. And between the two peaks, there is a marked trail 
which is interpreted as being a ritual processional trail marked by earthfast upright stones, all belonging to a dim and distant past shrouded in mystery. And legend and lore attributes this to be the, hub, the abode of the ancient mythical goddess of Anu. And Anu is well known to all of us in terms of being the earth goddess from whom all life emerged from the, the world itself. So these are holy mountains, and in a sense, they are ritual mountains common not only to Ireland, but to every culture throughout the world. So there is little doubt that the Paps, like so many other sacred mountains, were the focus for religious ceremony and ritual activity in the prehistoric past. They connect us to, in a sense, the heaven. They are the potentially the abode of the dead, temples of the god, and the preferred location for cairns and cairns and passage tombs. Speaking of which, when we look at high ground, I remember seeing this movie years ago. It's a bit of a turkey in my view, <laughs> but the storyline is interesting. Um, in Wales, you have Garth Hill, and the movie celebrates a fictional tale of a pompous surveyor in the form of Hugh Grant, who arrives to measure officially in the year 1917, the official height of the mountain. Now remember in Britain that mountains are classified as mountains if they are higher than 1000 feet. And 1000 feet converts to 304 uh, meters. And if it's lower than that, it's a hill. Now the locals always argued that this was a mountain and there was prestige attached to being nestled and settled at the foot of a mountain. So Hugh Grant arrives as an official surveyor and proceeds to undertake leveling or height leveling to the summit and comes back with a height which is less than the threshold required to classify it as a mountain, which caused uproar in the village and what they did was they dispatched the beautiful Tara Fitzgerald to distract him while the locals ascended the mountain with a work detail and artificially raised a platform of rock on the hilltop and insisted he go and measure again. And of course, when he measured again, he came back with a different height, which classified the hill as a mountain and all were happy in the end. So there's the story for you. So that's one way of looking at mountains. In Ireland, no such rigor is attached to classification. And the Ordnance Survey allowed, and always has allowed, local place names to dictate what is a hill or what is a mountain. So when we look at Ackle topography, we don't have to worry therefore about the niceties or the nuances of mountain versus hill. But when you look at the heights of these uh, hills and mountains, they are impressive. Schlieve Moor, 671 above sea level, going to Dugort to, down to 211 on the right, a lowly, uh, nonetheless impressive. But what makes a mountain or a hill impressive when viewed? Well, geographers have looked at this whole point and there are two approaches that you can look uh, at any hill or mountain. The geographer uh, Roderick Peaty wrote that mountains should be impressive they should enter into the imagination of people who live in their shadows. Unfortunately, it is next to impossible to include such intangibles in a definition. And he also wrote that mountains should have bulk and they also should have individuality. And that mountain climber Peter Wilson added another one called separateness. separateness. So if you've got all of those qualities, then you can look at parts of your landscape and say, that is impressive. It is bulk, it is individual, and it is separate. And that's, for me, for my uh, books, sufficient to classify anywhere as a mountain. And when we look at Ackle in terms of its place names and its color and symbolism, I looked at the map and I looked at other resources, including Loganamta, and you get interesting clues that Schlieve Moore shows up as Bingurum, the Blue Mountain Peak. Over on the left-hand side, you have an incredible, amazing piece of quartz, a gigantic piece of quartz, the biggest I've ever seen, 
known locally as Tlacfion or the White Rock. And then you have the White Ridge, Omer Abon, which could refer again to the quartz. And bear in mind what the geology of Akal is. It is quartzites, schists, and quartz. So the very whiteness and the color of symbolism of Akal may be influencing some of the names. And when I look at Schlieve Moore in particular, have a look at the cross section at the top, using Google Earth here to draw a north-south from left to right. And you can see the impressiveness of Schlieve Moor as it rises dramatically out of the landscape. And directly below it, we have a view again from Google Earth where I'm positioning myself in the lake. And again, I'm looking north now. And over on the left, I've pulled in my map of Akel and added the contours just to accentuate the hill or the mountain. And I've added the geology and I've added the archeology. span And what I'm seeing here is an affinity between cultural settlement and the slopes of Cleemoor itself. That gets my attention. In a separate publication, which is about to come out, I have a chapter which is looking at the sky, the dark sky, and the north sky in particular. And I've just lifted one of my illustrations that, you know, when you look north, what are you looking at? You're looking at the circumpolar stars in the heavens. You're looking at our plough. Bear in mind that in prehistory, the star positions were very different due to the changed tilt of the Earth's axis at that time. But in this book, Advances or Advancing Cultural Astronomy, I have a paper coming out, which is entitled The North Sky and the Other World, Journeys of the Dead in the Neolithic Considered, where I've wrestled with the whole idea of being able to look at landscape, look at sky and relate both in a cultural sense. And when I look at the sky, I can use computer graphics and planetary software to view the sky and look south and reimagine what prehistoric and pre people in prehistory would have seen. The rising sun at the winter solstice here, the rising sun at the summer solstice there. So this whole view is very much compressed. And then the arc followed by the sun in the sky. Similarly, the stars and the horizon, that all important liminal zone out of which everything celestial rose and into which everything celestial set with the exception of circumpolar stars to the north. Now we move to dark sky and I'm on 42 minutes, so I'm going to quicken up. This is a dramatic reconstruction of the brightening sky across Europe between 1992, 2010. And that is sufficient, even though it's out of date, to illustrate the incredible and sad statistic that our annual brightness is growing and it is growing, the latest statistic is 2% per annum. And the intensity is also growing at 2% per annum. So therefore we are losing the night. Compare that to the prehistoric landscapes that I've just described where none of that was there and there was no light pollution and the only illumination in the sky would have come from natural sources and the moon when it's in phase. Today, we've got a problem and we have to redress that problem in whatever way we can. And if we look in at Akel in particular and the whole island in general, we have this kind of visualization taken at night from space, showing us centers of population and their light. And all of these sources are urban, mostly. And if you happen to be lucky enough to live where Akel Island is, you have mostly, almost pristine or near pristine skies in comparison to some of the major conurbations on the island. And we're better than Europe, but not that much. And if we're growing at 2%, we need to watch out and we need to take care. And if I look at how we do this, 
We have fun. We live in the best of times and the worst of times. The worst of times I won't talk about. The best of times is our science and our technology. And if you look here at this graphic showing a rotating Earth and a satellite in polar orbit, which was put up in 2011 to measure sky brightness and to feed that data back down to scientists. And VIIRS sensor is a type of sensor that can detect the power of a street lamp from 800 kilometers out in space. Bear in mind that the International Space Station is at 400 kilometers high. This satellite is in polar orbit at 800 kilometers high and can sense and measure light pollution and sky brightness. VIIRS stands for Vertical Infrared Imaging Radiometric Suite. I'll only say that once because I'll forget it. <laughs> mm. And that is a dramatic view of the US continent. It doesn't show Ireland in that graphic. But I can use the derivatives and the products coming down from that satellite. And these are tools which are available to us all now to produce sky brightness maps. This one of Mayo. I know that Georgia and her team and the Mayo Dark Sky Group are now out on the islands and they're using handheld meters to measure and monitor light. And this is a precise way, a ground-based way of intensively collecting great data. But we can do it from space as well to a certain extent. And that is a graphic which is so revealing in terms of Ackle up on the left, Clare Island and Inish Turk, which are part of our Dark Sky Festival Week tonight. And then you get the light pollution. And we saw in some of the images last night how photographs taken on Clare Island were picking up pollution from Westport and Castle Bar in the distance, but nonetheless discernible and intrusive. Um, so the problem is there. And with tools like this, which are space-based and science-based, we can take action. And who takes action? Mayor Dark Skies and other groups like Loch Gur and Kerry and others who are activists doing all this great work in conjunction with local authorities, planners and decision makers. That's the team that will make the change and arrest this problem before it becomes unreversible. And if I look at what Georgia and the Mayo Dark Sky Group are doing, you know, we categorize the sky quality now using this map or handheld meters, and we measure the pristineness of the sky. That was not a problem in prehistory, but is a problem now. And if your sky quality is gold, it gets a particular measure. I'm not going to go into sky quality, magnitude per arc second squared. That means something to the specialists involved. Just think of them as numbers, as categories. And you've got, in a sense, quality measurements, which if you fall into are great at the top end and worrying if you're off the scale at the lower end. So these new, score, new world sky atlas of artificial sky brightness is available on the web to everybody and can be judged and uh, listened to. When I view the night sky in retrospect, here's a view of Schlieve Moore. And I fitted the night sky in 3500 BC and superimposed it. And in the foreground, you can imagine the ritual cultural landscape where that little red dot is here, but around here is where the tombs are. And I'm positioned in the lake. And I'm looking northwards towards this uh, beautiful mountain, this cosmic mountain, this holy mountain, and the sacred sky, the ephemeral sky, the incredible sky. And I've taken the liberty of creating a working title for a project, Schlieve Moore Ackel, an island cosmology in the Neolithic. And I've dared to say Prendergast in preparation. This is the cart before the horse, Georgia. Normally I undertake the research and I give the talk. Tonight I've given the talk and in preparing the talk, I have found a research topic. So this is to be revisited and requires boots on the ground and instruments on the ground and field walking for me to advance it further. And I'll go back to Carl Sagan to nearly end my talk with a wonderful quote. The earth is the only world known to us to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species 
can migrate. Visit, yes, settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we have to make our stand. And that's what you guys are all about, making a stand. And the final, final slide is a piece of music inspired by Enya when she became aware of Sark Island in the Channel Islands, who are designated as a dark sky island. So Ackle, Inish Turk and Clare Island, think of yourselves as looming dark sky islands. And I've got Enya's phone number. And if you become designated, I'll ring her and she may write a song similar to the one I'm gonna play you now and play out on this. And with that, thank you for listening. Thank you, Frank. That was wonderful. It was really insightful. Um, I'm nearly asleep listening to Enya. We'll hold you to her concert and the scopes will sleep more. Um, there's a good few questions coming in. Anne-Marie Leahy is asking why they built 
stone or why they didn't build stone houses as well as tombs? Um, lovely question. There is general consensus in archaeology that the materiality of stone was reserved for the dead and the burial and the interment of the dead and that timber was a material for the life and living. So there is that great division in terms of certainly the Neolithic and you see it so much uh, across Europe and at Stonehenge and elsewhere, they, there's a great realization that stone was used for burial mounds for its longevity, its permanence, and its impressiveness, I guess, as well. And oh, yeah. interestingly, interestingly, with um, Neolithic houses, because I was fortunate enough to be working with Transport Infrastructure Ireland just last month in finalizing a revision of the inventory of Neolithic houses in Ireland. It's a project I started and then touched base and they wanted me to finish it. So I was able to upgrade work that had been done by Jessica Smith, another great archeologist whose pioneering work on houses was, is, led, is well known. But la timber houses in the Neolithic were ritually burned. They think on the death of the inhabitant or the head of the household. So they moved on and they would have built another house. So everywhere they've excavated Neolithic timber houses in particular, there is clear evidence of burning. And uh, so that destruction of the property may have had something to do with the migration of the person's spirit or soul into the heavens, the afterlife, the other world. Uh, good question. Um, so stone for the dead, timber for the living. Right, that's really interesting. Um, G. Burkett is wondering where those fabulous human face carvings are now that were found by. I, I think they're in the museum. I meant to read further on that one, but um, if you go to the Ackle uh, Fields Archaeological School, there is a number of online publications, so they're easily found. Uh -huh. um, you should get all that information there. But generally, artifacts that are recovered will always go to the museum. Right. Um, again, back to Steve Moore. Terry Mosley is wondering um, if the cluster of sites at Steve Moore would be because of the south facing slope with the bulk, bulk of the mountain behind them, sheltering them from the north winds and Atlantic gales. Yeah, partly that. And there's a, there's a number of factors at play here. And I think I've got, uh, when I've delved into the archeology span of the tombs, I have reason to suspect that there is um, a link between one aspect of the tombs and the mountain itself, which would be no surprise. But clearly from a settlement point of view, being juxtaposed between the shelter of the North mountain and the proximity of the lake. And they are right between and surrounding the water course itself. So that would have been a major resource in its time. Presuming the lake level is the same then as it is now. We don't know that, of course. I know at Loch Gur, for example, um, there's clear evidence that the lake at Loch Gur was much bigger than it is now. So changes happen over time and certainly over millennia. But no, Terry is absolutely right there. Um, there are a whole number of factors. It's no one simple answer. But this is why you need to field visit, why you need to undertake the field work and gather the data and then look at the, um, then analyze the topography in the context of what you find, uh, taking into account archaeoastronomy, and I've hardly mentioned archaeoastronomy at all. And what is archaeoastronomy? It is all about um, investigating tombs in terms of mainly their alignment, their interconnectivity, and their relationship or possible relationship with aspects of the sky in terms of what people saw rising and setting on the horizon. Um, but archaeoastronomy has become so much wider and broader now than just one thing. Um, so archaeoastronomy integrates itself solidly into archaeology, which might explain why I spent so many years at UCD. <laughs> well spent. Certainly. Georgia, how are we for time? Are we can just we... having a look there? Um, so we, we probably have time for uh, it's 10 past eight now, so um, probably have another five minutes I think just to take a couple more questions yep. um, and wrap up but um, yeah we're, and, and th there is quite a wrap up because Frank you were outstanding so I, 
<laughs> can't hold myself back. Thank you so much. Not at all. No, I'll keep going. You just you just keep me on the hook. Yeah. Brilliant. <clears throat> I've no time. I'm, I'm going nowhere like nobody else. Like nobody else. <laughs> You'd like to see more itself. I think this one might be from my neighbour, Sheila Mangan. Is the trigonometry structure on Steve Moore the original or no, has that been no, replaced? No. Um, the, uh, the first triangulation pillars or trig pillars as they're called for short, <clears throat> uh, were flat stones, generally a very large, heavy stone, and they bored a hole in the middle and they picked a stone that would be pretty well unmovable. Now, Given that they are mountain peaks, they were not likely to be interfered with by the locals down below. These were places you'd only climb to if you had to. And the Severas went there and uh, selected a large stone flat, bored a hole and set up the Great Theodolite over its centre. When the Triangulation of Ireland was revised in the 1950s, a great new mapping campaign started with modern instrumentation to upgrade the maps and produce new maps. They tried as far as possible to build the modern pillars in the same location or as close as possible to, but it was a complete remeasurement. So you could say that where you see a trig pillar <clears throat> on the summit is where the first 1830s trig pillar or trig station might be a better word, uh, was first placed. So I think that would answer the question. And those triangulation pillars are largely defunct now because today we measure everything from space using constellations of satellites, GPS being one, Galileo being another, GLONASS being another, the Russian and then the Chinese have a system as well. There are, and then possibly India. So there may be four or five positioning systems in space and you can now get your instruments which can talk to all of them and incredibly locate yourself to a few millimeters using particular techniques in an instant nearly. So, you know, we, as I said, we live in wonderful times in terms of science and technology and what we can do with spatial data and how that benefits civilization. Because I know, for example, um, recent fires and floods and disasters are now mapped almost acquired in real time by satellites in space transmitted to ground stations given to scientific organizations who then map and inform the um, rescue and emergency authorities of what is where in terms of a disaster. And they're doing this on a daily basis. I mean, it is phenomenal what we can now do in terms of assisting human beings in difficulty using this kind of technology. And I've mentioned the, the dark sky, I've mentioned light pollution and how ground-based and space-based methods will help us to identify areas which are threatened. And of course, it's all about mitigation, isn't it? And it's all about cooperation and it's all about persuasion and doing the right thing in terms of lighting policy. And, you know, there are plenty of scientists. You have um, Niall Smith at CIT Black Croc. You have Brian Espy at Trinity, all of whom are good colleagues of ours. And we all work together in different ways. And uh, these people between them and the team between them are giving the right information to the decision makers because that's where the power is to make the change. I think just on that point, um, Frank, because it's, it's so relevant for us this week, um, we have a few events um, coming up that we'll be specifically looking at that. It, especially on Monday, we'll have um, a dark sky advocacy night uh, for Dark Sky Ireland. So um, if anyone is interested in getting involved in this uh, topic, and there's a couple of questions in the Q&A at the moment asking about light pollution increases and what can we do uh, to tackle it. The best thing you can do is to uh, look at the Dark Sky, uh, International Dark Sky Association and Dark Sky Ireland, darksky.ie. I'll pop that in the chat. Um, and join us on Monday night, um, if not before, so you're aware of you know, what's going on in Ireland, because um, there is a, a growing, I call it movement, or campaigners to, uh, to try and tackle light pollution. I saw a nice question there just pop up, if I can be so presumptuous, would it be possible to mark the best spots on the island? But I mean, in terms of the islands and the surveys that you're doing, Georgia, and your team, uh, with people on the ground and the instruments, what is your aim and what is your plan? Um, 
Well, we're, we've just started, as uh, Sarah mentioned, we've started um, taking uh, handheld light meter measurements. Um, well, actually we started a couple of years ago with some citizen science uh, research. So we're trying to identify the problem areas first. We'll um, move some fixed meters onto the islands, all, all three islands. We have Ackle, Inishtuck and uh, Clare Island. And it then takes quite a long process to, to measure the sky over a prolonged period to incorporate um, the astrophotography that we saw tonight in, in Sarah's presentation and, um, and to, uh, to join with Mayo Dart Sky Park and you know, through community events to, um, to raise the profile and then to put, to put in an extended application uh, to, to include the islands and North Mayo Coast because the, the um, as you all know, uh, Frank, you know, the Kaja coast is fantastic as well. Oh, yeah. And they're also taking light pollution measurements um, to, to join us. I hope that answers right. the question. So that there's a few more for you. Well, we have uh, maybe two, two more, Sarah, what do you think? No problem for me. Yeah, okay. Delighted. Delighted. Um, Frank, do you want to choose them? Because... Oh. I'm not the expert here, so you might be better to pick a, a one that would. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go through them uh, from Shane. Are court tombs orientated towards prominent features in the landscape of the mountains? I can't comment on that, Shane, because I've not studied the court tombs, but I have studied the passage tombs. And of the 230 passage tombs that remain or are extant, a significant proportion of their passages do face other cairns. That has come out of research that I undertook. And not only that, of those that point to other tombs or cairns or prominent peaks, the target is always elevationally higher. There is no instance where when a tomb is aligned, it points at something lower down. So there is hierarchy in height. There was regard for height. And if you visit my website, if you Google TU Dublin and Arrow, Arrow is the digital repository of TU Dublin. I have a lot of my non-copyrighted material up there and you'll find plenty of material to actually download for free and have a browse. And there's one paper, I think it's called Interpreting Tomb Alignments. So if you just have a look for that, you'll find it. Um, we have also uh, shared the link to the, uh, the book, um, the Bloomsbury publication, Frank. So oh, great. Thanks. That's in there and well yeah. worth getting your hands on, folks. Um, yeah. Some of these books can be rather expensive because they tend to be academic texts rather than popular texts. So they can hurt the pocket. <clears throat> Regardless, um, Peter asked, is the change of a house floor plan from square to round at the brink of the Bronze Age? connected to a particular wave of migration to the island. Well, in terms of, um, it's not just the island of Akel where you see this manifesting itself. Bronze Age houses generally were round. Uh, so you get this change from rectangular in the Neolithic to round in the Bronze Age. As to why that happened, um, you have in a sense, two different traditions of people on the island. You have the passage tomb builders and the other Neolithics who were building uh, rectangular houses in their time, 3,700 BC up to about 2,500 BC. And as you move into the Bronze Age, which is beginning around 2,500 after that, um, you then get this shift into round houses, all of which are again timber. Not a simple answer, I'm afraid, but that's the broad brushstroke of an answer. Are all stone circles from the Bronze Age? Um, mostly. Um, the one in Loch Gur, Grain Circle, interestingly, was dated accurately by Rose Cleary, Cork archaeologist. And that turned out to have a date of 2700, 800, 900 BC, putting it into the Middle Neolithic. But in general, the majority of stone circles are Bronze Age. Um, so far, so good. I think we're, any more? Uh, well, we have maybe one more, uh, Mary uh, for Midgen there. Okay. Can I just... Let us know which megalith megalithic monuments in Ackle or close to are connected with the astronomical measurements. Now, there's a, there's a question. 
Um, well, let's, let's put it this way, Mary. Um, I've yet to um, visit these tombs and to uh, take measurements. Um, astronomical measurements involve measuring the orientation. Um, if you can determine the axis of the passage, if the tomb is in sufficiently good condition. And I know the tomb vernacle are in various conditions from you know, medium to poor. Nonetheless, there may well be enough to uh, look at. I do have the archeological drawings which have been recorded and we measure their orientation, but we also measure the altitude of the skyline in the direction. And then we do some calculations and we can then deduce or determine anything of interest which may have been associated with that particular view in the period when the tomb was actually built. And the nice thing is we know when the tombs were built. But we can also do other things. Um, we can build uh, terrain models and integrate them into planetarium software so that you can then be situated at that place and then change the clock back to the time when the tomb was constructed so as to make the sky that's viewed relevant to the time of the tomb. And that's another tool in the toolbox. So there are many ways in which we can look at the landscape, look at the monuments. And what I do stress is that the bad old days of archaeoastronomy are thankfully largely gone when people set out to hunt for alignments and then fitted their theories to what they found. It is completely turned around now. Everything is culturally driven, has to be culturally meaningful, and has to be solidly embedded with and in the archaeology of the landscape in which you are working. So hence, I say archaeoastronomy is just an elemental part of a much bigger discourse to do with the landscape, the area, the monuments, the locality, and what I call the total environmental domain, the skyscape, the landscape. And then you have the phenomenology, you know, what do you experience when you go there as well? So that could detain me for uh, a couple of weeks, Georgia, on the island. And you might do well to uh, find me a cheap B&B. &B. <laughs> I think after, after tonight, you'd be very, very welcome on the, on the island at any time. Uh, am I right, Sarah? Yeah, of course. You'll have to come up for a cup of tea anyways, Frank. Yeah, and we'll... yeah it'll be, surely it'll be At the very time. least. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will, we will definitely make that happen. I think we may have to draw a close to the, the questions, um, but we have a copy of all of them. So, Frank, if you don't mind, I might liaise with you on a few of them um, afterwards, uh, just to make sure you, you've seen them all. And if we sure. can't all get back to any burning questions, then, then we will do. I think that's probably the best thing to do. But um, well, Sarah, thank you for hosting and thank you for, for having us. Um, and Carol, thank you, has been there just in the background, but she's been doing a great job and keeping a, an eye on all the, the, the comments coming in. It's, it's not easy with so many people. So we've had a fantastic turnout. Um, and Frank, I'm lost for words, but um, all I can say is Goramila Mila Mahaga for a fantastic evening. Um, it's, it was outstanding. I know you've put so much work into this and it's it's a very different talk to the one that you had uh, planned originally. And I'm so grateful that you, you've done this um, for us and really given us a great start to, to look at Ackle as a dark sky destination. So thank you very much for that. Um, and thanks to everyone who attended. I might just share, it's a bit late now, but I might just share where everyone is from uh, to close off that, um, that little survey. So if you just bear with me one. Second. Sorry, sorry, just one second. No, uh, oh, wrong screen. Sorry, this isn't set up. Um, I might have to come back to that because it's not actually uh, one. I just have to refresh the screen now. It was, it was there all evening, and now it's it's vanished off my screen when I finally wanted to, to to use it. So. Sorry, folks. Let's don't hurry, don't hurry. It's well worth waiting for. It is well worth waiting for. Here we are. So we have, um, a, we had a really good turnout tonight. Uh, there was nearly 300 people on online. So we have, uh, again, New York have joined us. 
I think it's the third night in a row, so thank you for that. Um, we've got Singapore, we have USA, we have, of course, Mayo and Ackle uh, strongly, and Dublin there in the centre with a, a, a good number. Um, Essex, we have Shetland Islands, Scotland, um, Burgundy, France, Pennsylvania, USA. So I will share an Aachen in Germany. Thank you, you've joined us before. So I will share that um, on our Facebook page um, afterwards. And um, just to, to say again, thank you very much, Frank. Um, thanks to everyone uh, for, for joining us. And I hope that you'll come to back to join us tomorrow evening. And thereafter, we have a, still a great lineup ahead. Um, tomorrow we move to Ballycroy home of the National Park and the uh, Visitor Centre for the Mayo Dark Sky Park. So um, without, I, I guess, uh, any more to be said, but thank you all. It's been my pleasure. Thanks, Frank. Good night. Night. Brilliant. I'm going to do a screenshot. So if we do a little smile at the camera there, Frank, we'll, um, we'll get you for the, the Facebook. Yeah.